Anne Boleyn has to be one of the most famous women in English history, and yet for such a well-known person, she's still a mystery. Was she a vicious schemer, or a woman pushed to power by ambitious male relatives? Was she a wronged wife, or an incestuous harlot? In short, was Anne Boleyn a good person, or a bad person, or somewhere in between? Anne was born into England's 16th century aristocracy to Thomas Boleyn, Earl of Ormond and of Wiltshire, and his wife, Elizabeth Howard, who was daughter to Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk. She was most likely born around 1500 at Blickling, Norfolk. There is a source which suggests she might have been born in 1507 based on a letter Anne wrote in French to her father while in the Low Countries in 1514, which historian Eric Ives argues shows a maturity that could not have been exhibited by a young child and so it's more likely she was a teenager by then. Anne was the middle child of three surviving children, with a sister Mary, a few years older than her, and a brother George, younger than her by around four years. Anne's childhood was a secure one. Not only did she come from a wealthy family that had risen to hold claim to noble titles, but she was also given a good education for a girl of her rank. She was taught arithmetic, literature, history, reading, spelling and writing, as well as being taught on religious subjects. Her education would have included practical skills such as dancing, household management, embroidery, good manners, music, needlework and singing lessons. But her greatest education in courtly manners was yet to come. Her father Thomas was a successful courtier and he did well at the English court, also securing places there for George and Mary. But Anne was to have an even better placement for her teen years. In 1512, Thomas Boleyn was appointed as ambassador to Margaret of Austria, governor of the Habsburg Netherlands, presiding over the most prestigious court in Europe at the time. This meant any young nobleman or woman who found a place there would receive the education of a lifetime. Luckily for Anne, her father impressed Margaret enough to secure his daughter a place at court in Margaret's household. Anne arrived the following year in 1513 as a teenager and made an equally good impression on Margaret, who wrote that her new charge was bright and pleasant for her young age. This was the point at which Anne's education changed from that simply of a nobleman's future wife to a lady of the court, particularly in learning the French language as her father wanted. Letters from Anne at the time suggest the main reason behind this was to hope for a place in the household of Catherine of Aragon, who spoke French alongside English and her native Spanish. However, in August 1513, Anne instead went to join the service of Mary Tudor, Henry VIII's sister, who married the elderly King Louis XII the following year in October of 1514. Mary was only 18 at the time, so with Anne being similar in age, they likely got on well at the time. However, the French king would live only a few months into his new marriage. By the 1st of January 1515, Louis XII died, leaving Mary a young widow. When Mary Tudor went home to England, Anne stayed in France and became a maid of honour to Queen Claude who was married to the new king of France, Francis I. Again, Anne was close to Claude due to them being a similar age and she would stay on there for another seven years. Anne was able to complete her understanding of the French language as well as a growing interest in French clothing, music, etiquette and dance. Most importantly, she also became well-versed in the arts of flirtation and courtly love. These were things that would set her apart from other English ladies at court when she returned home in 1521. Anne was now 21 years old, 
well-educated and an attractive catch for any nobleman. A prestigious marriage had to be arranged. Her uncle Thomas Howard was having issues deciding on who should have the post of the King's Lieutenant in Ireland and saw a way to remedy this with marriage for his niece. The Bolins, despite being English, had a strong claim to the Earldom of Ormond, but rival Irish claimant Pierce Butler wanted it too. Thomas Howard decided he could offer the position to Butler if there was an arrangement reached that Anne would marry Butler's son James, bringing the two families together and ensuring future claimants would be connected by the marriage. However, the proposal fell through, but Anne wouldn't be short of men willing to ask for her hand. The following year in 1522, Anne finally secured a place at court as a lady-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's wife. A few months later, Anne would be publicly made aware of when she danced at the Chateau Vert pageant in honour of the imperial ambassadors on the 4th of March, dressed in white embroidered dresses with gold thread. Courtiers, especially the male ones, were impressed with her grace and stylishness, with others praising her accomplishments, her quick wit and her intelligence. Despite no actual portraits from when she was alive still existing, it's clear that Anne's appeal went beyond the physical. The descriptions we do have of Anne suggest she had a long face like her daughter Elizabeth, luxurious dark hair, expressive eyes and a long neck. A friend once described her as good-looking enough. The next candidate for marriage was Henry Percy, later to be the 6th Earl of Northumberland. He wanted to break off a prior engagement and marry Anne instead, and the pair entered into a secret engagement together. However, the proposal wasn't backed by both his father, also named Henry Percy, and Cardinal Wolsey, and so the marriage never happened. Court gossip by 1525 also suggested there may have been an affair between Anne and the married court poet Thomas Wyatt, but it's highly unlikely Anne would have got herself involved with a married man when she was such a catch. It's more likely, along with many other men at court, Wyatt was emotionally involved with Anne within the protocol of courtly love, but that this was unrequited. It wasn't until 1526 that Henry VIII seems to have really noticed Anne. On Shrove Tuesday, the court took part in a joust, part of the celebrations for the end of Lent, and something that was a favourite of Henry's. Years before, he had ridden out with K's embroidered on his horse's dressings to represent the name of his wife Catherine. This time, he rode out with a burning heart embroidered on his tabard with the slogan, Declare je non, declare I dare not. It was, in fact, an absolute declaration of his feelings for a woman, for Anne, in fact. But Henry was known for making clear his advances to the next notch on his bedpost, and courtiers would only have whispered about who this might have been in order to gain favours through her. But in 1527, everyone suddenly took more notice. At first, Henry absolutely saw Anne as nothing more than a sexy replacement for her sister Mary, with whom he had just ended an affair. But it would seem Anne held herself back enough that his infatuation grew deeper. The English king was renowned for hating the task of writing letters, and yet between 1527 and 1528, he wrote Anne no less than 17 of them. Catherine of Aragon and Henry were, by this point, no longer sharing a bed, and they had only one child, a daughter named Mary. By the spring of 1527, Henry had decided he would find a way to put his wife aside in order to remarry and have a male heir. At first, Henry would likely have thought, along with advisors such as Wolsey, that his future second wife would be a foreign princess. 
However, it wasn't long before Henry might have realised he could have Anne and fulfil the need for a new wife. The general population were not likely to complain about a homegrown spouse, but nevertheless Catherine was popular. Anne was also highly skilled in the game of courtly love and she resisted Henry's attempts while still keeping him interested. However, at the same time, he appears to have convinced Anne that he was, in law, free to marry. This was on the basis that Catherine had previously and briefly been married to his elder brother Arthur. Unfortunately for Arthur, he had died aged 15 and only a few months into his marriage with his new young bride. Catherine insisted that despite being married, for whatever reason, it had never been consummated. This meant, in canon law, that technically she wasn't legally Arthur's wife. However, with only two people able to prove this was the case, and one of them being dead, it was easy for Henry to claim the opposite, and that he was being punished by the heavens for marrying his brother's wife, and that the outcome of this was also that he would not have any living sons. With Henry apparently making it clear he was able to find wife number two, Anne must have seen an opportunity. Instead of simply becoming a royal mistress, she could become Henry's next wife. But not everyone was on board with the radical decision of putting aside a wife unwilling to be removed. The Pope, wanting to maintain good relations with Charles V of Spain, Catherine's nephew, who had him imprisoned at the time, put a spanner in the works and publicly declared he was against Henry marrying Anne when a papal dispensation was applied for in the summer of 1527. Fed up with how things were dragging on, Henry decided to do away with waiting for the decision of the Holy See in Rome, instead setting up his own ecclesiastical court headed by Thomas Wolsey. Henry appeared himself in court to defend the validity of his marriage, but then it was decided expert opinions had to be sought, which never materialised, and in May the trial was permanently adjourned. The trial's real purpose was probably to lay the groundwork for a separation, and on the 22nd of June, Henry formally asked Catherine if she would be happy breaking up with him. Unsurprisingly, she said no, which made things somewhat more difficult. But during this period, Anne and Henry grew closer, and she began to take on the more political roles of being a queen before actually being one. In the years before their marriage, Anne was able to grant petitions, give patronage, and likely had a great deal of influence over Henry. However, despite the rumours that the king and Anne were already sleeping together, it's more probable they actually weren't, as Henry knew any son he had would need legitimacy. In 1528, the dreaded sweating sickness broke out, and Anne retreated to Hever Castle, but she still contracted the illness. Henry VIII was especially nervous of any severe illness, and he moved constantly around his palaces to keep out of the way of potential infection, including ensuring his daughter Mary, at the time his only heir, was also kept out of harm's way. When Anne fell ill, Henry immediately sent his own physician to care for her, and she recovered shortly afterwards. At first, Anne was happy to wait it out while Wolsey attempted to secure a papal dispensation for his king, but as time dragged on, she lost faith in him. Anne became certain that Wolsey didn't really want the marriage to go ahead, and in 1529 she threw her lot in with other courtiers who wanted rid of him for their own reasons. Thomas Wolsey was a man who had come from humble origins to be by the side of the king, and there were plenty who were jealous of his position. In the same year, Anne's efforts ensured Wolsey was removed from public office, replaced by nobles who proved to be just as ineffective as him at convincing the Pope to change his mind about the marriage. From Anne's point of view, 
She must have been frustrated with the lack of progress, and she began to turn to more radical ways to speed things up. While in France, Anne had possibly already been exposed to ideas about the Reformation, and she gave Henry selected passages from the book Obedience of a Christian Man, in which William Tyndale argued that kings had authority over the church. Henry had once been described as defender of the faith by the Pope for his published writings on the authority of Rome, but this idea of kings being in charge of their country over the authority of the church took root in Henry's head. Devout as he was, he needed an answer to his great matter. However, this was not merely a matter of bagging herself a king. Anne appears to have also been genuinely devout and sympathetic to the cause of the Reformation. It's possible that she recognised if she became queen it would allow her to further the patronage of reformists and encourage their ideas in England. Not long after, Henry sent to Rome for a dispensation that would allow him, in the view of his marriage to Catherine being annulled, to marry any woman he chose, even within the first degree of affinity. While we may not think of them as being related, Many people at the time viewed Henry's relationship with Anne as a little too close since he had also slept with her sister. The king also commissioned several scholars to argue his case, looking for passages in the Bible that basically would allow him to set Catherine aside. Most argued Henry's first marriage should never have been given a dispensation as divine law stated the marriage was already wrong from the start and that in Leviticus, apparently if translated into the original Hebrew, the Bible promised no sons would be born from a man marrying his widowed sister-in-law. Bible passages to the contrary were conveniently ignored. Further to this, Catherine swore under the seal of the confession that she had never laid with Arthur as his wife, but had merely gone to sleep beside him in the same bed. Tired of waiting for Rome to make a decision, Henry instead arranged for a legatine court to meet at Blackfriars in May 1529. Catherine was called to appear, and she tried to argue for the honour of both herself and her daughter Mary. Henry laid out the case that he was in the right and should set Catherine aside, and when it became clear the whole thing was for show, Catherine, understandably, stormed out of court. However, Catherine was still queen for now, and she and Henry still had to spend mealtimes and some periods at court together, even if it often ended in blazing arguments. Anne was particularly put out when she realised in June 1530 that Henry was still asking Catherine to make his shirts for him. We can only hope Catherine made them too small, just for fun. On the 11th of July, 1531, it was the last time Catherine and Henry ever saw each other. She was moved to the Moor Castle in Hertfordshire, while their daughter Mary would remain at Windsor. For a final act of spite, Henry also forbid Catherine from seeing their daughter, and she never would again. Despite the assurances of the English legatine court ruling in his favour, Henry was still uncertain about going ahead with his second marriage. Despite the popular opinion that he broke with Rome, the king in fact attempted to do everything in his power to remain part of the Catholic Church while also getting his own way. But Anne was presumably getting somewhat impatient for results, considering she had held off advances from any other man for the last four years, and was now aged around 31. In September 1532, she was created Marchioness of Pembroke, a suitable title for a future queen, and this title was promised to her heirs, legitimate or otherwise. In the winter, she travelled by Henry's side to Calais, and had already, in the previous months, become very friendly with the French ambassador, Gilles de la Pommeraye, and was fast establishing an alliance with France. 
Henry's meeting with King Francis was primarily to engage his support for marrying Anne, especially as Francis and his wife Claude were already familiar with her. As it was, the French government did give their support and Francis met personally with Anne, but the French king still feared angering the Pope and so instead maintained his alliance with Rome. At this point, Anne must have realised there was still some hesitancy in Henry's plan to marry her and she relented in her own plan not to sleep with him. She understood that now, if she fell pregnant, especially with her biological clock ticking, the king would need to marry her to legitimise their child. It's assumed Anne fell pregnant around the time of the visit to Calais, and Henry and she were married in a secret ceremony on the 14th of November 1532. Anne's family benefited too. Her father was created Earl of Rochford, her Irish cousin James Butler became Earl of Ormond, and her widowed sister Mary received a pension of £100 that would continue until her own remarriage. As the marriage was considered improper, a second public ceremony took place on January the 25th, 1533, and Anne was declared as Queen on the 12th of April. Henry arranged it with his new Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, for his marriage to Catherine to be declared void in May of that year and his marriage to Anne valid. The Pope would excommunicate Cranmer and Henry for this, declaring that Rome had also broken away from England, urging Henry to return to Catherine. This left Henry as head of the Church of England. Catherine was formally stripped of her title as Queen, instead merely allowed to call herself Dowager Princess of Wales. Anne, meanwhile, was given a lavish coronation on the 1st of June 1533 in a memorable and magnificent ceremony at Westminster Abbey, followed up with a spectacular banquet afterwards. The day before, she had taken part in an elaborate procession through London, seated under a canopy of cloth of gold, wearing her hair loose in the traditional manner. As was probably to be expected, the reception from the public was lukewarm at best. Anne was also the last Queen Consort of England to be crowned separately from her husband, and she was also crowned with St Edward's crown, which was usually reserved only for monarchs. It's assumed this was because Anne was obviously pregnant by this point and everyone thought it was a boy. Therefore, using St. Edward's crown was like pointing a glaring future king arrow at Anne's stomach. Ironically, the child would indeed be a great future monarch, if not a son. Anne's motto as queen would be the most happy, which was optimistic to say the least, and she chose a white falcon as her personal device. Or more specifically, she chose a white falcon alighting on a dead tree stump, which then burst into Tudor roses. Subtle. Three months later in September, Anne went into labour. She had settled herself at Greenwich Palace to prepare for the birth, and all seemed to be going well. All the court astrologers and doctors but one had confidently predicted a boy, and King Francis had even been asked to stand as the boy's godfather. However, on the 7th of September, Anne gave birth not to a son, but to a daughter named Elizabeth. The traditional jousting tournament that had been arranged, usually to celebrate the birth of an heir, was hastily cancelled, and all notices about the Prince quickly had an S shoved on the end of the word to make it Princess. It was a huge blow for both Henry and Anne, although it wasn't the end of the world just yet. Elizabeth was still doted on by both of her parents and especially by Anne, who feared the presence of Henry's other daughter, Mary. To assuage his new wife's worries, Henry had Mary separated from her own staff and sent to Hatfield House, 
where her new baby half-sister now resided with her own personal staff. It must have been humiliating for poor teenage Mary, who had not only been stripped of her title of princess and forbidden from seeing her mother, but now had to live in the household of a half-sibling that represented the split between her parents. Nevertheless, she was known to be caring towards her baby sister Elizabeth. Anne also rubbed some courtiers up the wrong way by living far more ostentatiously than Catherine had with around 250 personal servants and a large personal female staff of 60 maids of honour. She and Henry both had expensive tastes, however, and so the king allowed her lavish spending on dresses, jewels, furniture and riding equipment, especially since she once again fell pregnant a few months after Elizabeth's birth. But while this display of wealth was used by her critics to show she wasn't really religious at all, it was expected of monarchy to show off the grandeur of their station, which was still believed to be ordained by God. But what had made Anne attractive as a mistress was less attractive as a royal wife. Her sharp wit, intelligence and political acumen had made her sexy, but it wasn't considered proper for a queen to argue with her king about matters or to disagree with him at all. Her role now had to be to support him, and after a miscarriage in August 1534, Henry posited the possibility of divorcing Anne without returning to Catherine to Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell. However, this never came to be as the couple made up and reunited, and in the following summer of 1535, they went off together on progress to visit Gloucester. However, letters from Anne revealed that Henry was struggling a little in the bedroom, perhaps because of psychological fears playing on his mind about still not having a son. In short, he had blamed his marriage to Catherine for lack of an heir, and it must have become obvious to him by now that he might be part of the problem. But Anne still managed to become pregnant again in October of that year, and hopes were once again high. Tensions began to grow for Anne. On one side was Mary and the behaviour you might expect from a stepdaughter pushed out from being future queen by her stepmother, and on the other side were the endless women waiting to take Henry's affections for their own family's gain. Mary understandably was unhappy in her new position, and she referred to Anne, as did Catherine, as that woman. Mary also blamed Anne for Henry's insistence that she should accept her new stepmother as queen, and in turn, Anne saw Mary's reluctance to do so as a sign she was still considered a mistress and nothing more, rather than Mary acting as a rightfully wounded daughter expressing her anger. Anne did try to reach out a few times, but she was angrily rejected. Anne didn't do much better with the common folk either. Catherine had been both a well-liked and a well-respected queen, and Anne was sadly neither. Some people did think she was a good queen, but no one liked the way Henry had treated a faithful wife, and even those who agreed with Henry ending his first marriage disagreed with how Princess Mary was treated. But the biggest thing against Anne was the fact she was unavoidably associated with Henry's break from Rome, and she furthered this by openly advocating for religious reforms. Thomas More and John Fisher, two men who spoke out against the reforms, became Anne's enemies at court, and when they were executed by Henry, she too was blamed for their deaths. But Anne didn't sit still as queen. She was especially involved in religion, and had even made a special study of the epistles of St. Paul. The Bible text Anne used was a French translation, which made sense considering she was likely to have picked up her taste for spirituality while at the French court. Some copies of evangelical French texts even survive in the Royal Library that was sought out for Anne herself. 
her brother George helped produce a hybrid copy of the Bible that was in the legal French language, but the more disruptive commentary was translated into English. Anne also ensured England was a safe haven for reformers fleeing persecution, and she had a hand in encouraging Henry to patronise like-minded clergy as well as doing some of this herself. And despite it being illegal still to have a copy of the Bible in English, a lectern Bible in English was available for her household to use, and Anne even owned an illuminated copy of William Tyndale's translation of the New Testament. Anne also had a particular interest in changing the monasteries. Like other reformers, she didn't actually want to get rid of them altogether, but simply to change their use for educational purposes. She was also concerned with poverty, and she attempted to alleviate the problem with her own personal charity, but also with providing job opportunities where possible. It is interesting that her daughter Elizabeth would be the monarch to overhaul the centuries-old problematic laws regarding poverty years later. Anne also contributed heavily to culture through her patronage of Hans Holbein. If you've seen any famous painting of the Tudors from Henry VIII onwards, there's a good chance it was either Holbein or someone copying a Holbein. She was his first patron in 1532 before her royal husband, and Holbein even designed an arch for Anne's coronation procession, as well as creating a rose water fountain for Anne's New Year's gift to Henry in 1534. The painting The Ambassadors is even a nod to Anne. The portrait is of Jean de Dinteville and Georges de Selve, two French diplomats who took part in Anne's coronation. The painting was done close to the time of the coronation and contains many symbols that pertain to the time of Anne's crowning, as well as reflecting many of her religious views. But regardless of the good Anne did as queen, she was soon to meet her downfall. Strangely, this began with the death of Catherine of Aragon, who died on the 8th of January 1536. The country was scandalised when Henry and Anne chose to wear yellow instead of black for mourning, yellow being the colour to represent joy. They did not hide the fact they were happy at the death of the king's first wife. Anne once again reached out to Mary to attempt to salvage their relationship, but the princess rejected her, especially as there were now rumours Catherine of Aragon had been poisoned. However, the basis for this was that her embalmers found her heart was completely black, and most people at the time thought this to be poison. But modern analysis suggests Catherine probably died of heart cancer. The Queen, knowing Henry now had little standing in his way of a third marriage if he decided to set Anne aside, knew she had to give birth to a boy. But it was also around this time the ageing King's wandering eye settled on one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, a young woman called Jane Seymour. The story goes that he apparently gave her a portrait miniature of himself, and Jane was messing about, opening and closing it in Anne's presence. After seeing what the locket contained, Anne snatched it so hard from Jane's neck that her fingers bled. Just a week or so later, Henry took part in a tournament and was knocked so hard from his horse that he was knocked unconscious for two hours. Whether it was one of these incidents, bad luck or karma, and miscarried her unborn child yet again. To make matters worse, the baby was a boy. Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador at the English court, gave the doom-laden comment, she has miscarried of her saviour. However, despite this popularly being seen as the point at which Henry put Anne to one side, she was actually still in a strong position at this point. Although Anne's enemies did start to plant the idea in the king's head of replacing her for Jane, Henry doesn't seem to have made any serious moves in that direction. Even in April 1536, 
he was still trying to get Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and his daughter Mary to both accept Anne as the rightful queen. The real sticking point actually came when Cromwell and Anne fell out over what should happen to the assets from the monasteries. Anne wanted to give the money to charitable and educational institutions, whereas Cromwell wanted to put the money directly into the royal coffers. Anne even tried to use preachers to modify royal policy on dissolving the smaller monasteries before it passed through Parliament, but to no avail. Her almoner, John Skip, gave a sermon condemning Cromwell as an avaricious and evil advisor. Anne also favoured a French alliance as she had for many years, and Cromwell preferred an imperial alliance with Emperor Charles. While it's obvious the two once strong allies now fell out, historians disagree as to whether this meant Cromwell set about planning Anne's downfall or if he was simply acting on the orders of Henry. Whatever the case, whether it was Cromwell trying to remove Anne once and for all to allow his political diplomacy with Spain, Henry wanting to rid himself of a wife who was now becoming more trouble than she was worth, or even if there was some genuine concern the Queen had lovers, Anne wouldn't last much longer as Queen. In late April 1536, Anne had a very public falling out with Henry Norris, groom of the stool to the King, but also someone who had previously been one of her biggest supporters. Picking a vulnerable target from Anne's lively and colourful entourage, Cromwell had her court musician, Mark Smeaton, arrested. He was questioned and possibly tortured, eventually giving a confession that stated he was the Queen's lover. But as he was likely tortured and at least pressured, this confession was probably not genuine. A few days later, during the May Day joust, Henry Norris was arrested, but as he was an aristocrat, he couldn't be tortured. He denied all charges of adultery, and he also added that the Queen was innocent. On the 2nd of May, Anne was sent to the Tower, as was her brother George, followed by other courtiers. Francis Weston, William Breton, Thomas Wyatt, the same poet who had felt so strongly towards Anne years before, and Richard Page. When Anne was taken to the Tower, she collapsed, begging to know the whereabouts of her father and sweet brother. They were all charged with adultery, including George Boleyn, who also had the charge of incest against both him and Anne. Never before or since had a queen publicly been accused of sleeping with her sibling and it sent shockwaves through the court and country. Most modern historians are overwhelmingly of the opinion that Anne was completely innocent of all charges. The only one of the suspects who ever confessed was Smeaton, and he was likely either pressured or tortured to do so. Norris was offered a pardon if he would confess, but he refused. Weston did not like Anne, and he was only dragged in because of a comment she made while in the tower. Barretton was added to the list by Cromwell, most likely to end his control over the Welsh marches, allowing Cromwell to reorganise the local government of Cheshire and the border area to his liking. Wyatt and Page, both known to be fans of Anne, were just lumped in to make it seem real and were never really intended to be executed. Grand juries in Middlesex and Kent found indictments on the basis of the Treason Act of Edward III, in which adultery by and to a queen was a form of treason, as then the children of the Queen might not be legitimate. The story was twisted that Anne and the others had planned to kill the King, Anne then marrying one of her lovers and taking the throne. It sounds unbelievable now, and it must have then as well. Henry, meanwhile, to the delight of those who wanted Anne out of the way, was being kept busy with Jane Seymour's charms. On the 12th of May 1536, Weston, Barretton, Smeaton and Norris were sent to trial and found guilty of high treason. 
This then made Anne and George's trial on the 15th of May, before a jury of 27 peers in the tower, rather pointless, as the jury simply had to agree to what had already been decided in the other trial. Anne and George were found guilty of adultery, incest and high treason. And two days later on the 17th of May, Cranmer found the marriage between Anne and Henry null and void, which also begged the question how she had been adulterous if she wasn't really married. Logic did not prevail in this mess. If nothing else, Anne was a woman who had gone four years, holding off not only from men in general, but from a king, while also convincing him to give up his first wife and marry her instead, all while her child-rearing years ticked by. She clearly was not a woman stupid enough to throw everything away for a lover, whoever it might have been. And on top of that, Anne was continually surrounded by a large retinue of female staff at all times, including her ladies-in-waiting, which would have made any romantic error of judgement completely impossible to hide. In other words, had the affairs really happened, Anne would have had to have at least a couple of ladies-in-waiting helping her, and yet none of them were ever charged, and all were kept on to serve the next Queen, Jane Seymour. Anne maintained her innocence throughout the trial and afterwards, and she had ready and constant answers to the questions put to her. Twice she would swear on the sacrament that she was innocent of all charges against her. Her brother George and the other men were all executed on the 17th of May. Anne seemed content and ready to die. She accepted her fate as there seemed little way out when she knew she was innocent. The only mercy Henry showed was to commute her sentence from being burned alive to being beheaded. And as Anne was a queen, instead of being executed with a common axe, Henry had an expert swordsman from France brought to England. There is no doubt that Anne probably suffered a severe mental breakdown and depression with what was happening, made clear by a statement from William Kingston, the constable of the tower at the time. On the morning of the 19th of May, he wrote, This morning she sent for me, that I might be with her at such time as she received the good Lord, to the intent I should hear her speak as touching her innocency, all way to be clear. And in the writing of this, she sent for me, and at my coming, she said, Mr. Kingston, I hear I shall not die afore noon, and I am very sorry, therefore, for I thought to be dead by this time, and past my pain. I told her it should be no pain, it was so little. And then she said, I heard say the executioner was very good, and I have a little neck and then put her hands about it, laughing heartily. I have seen many men and also women executed, and that they have been in great sorrow, and to my knowledge, this lady has much joy in death. Sir, her almoner is continually with her, and had been since two o'clock after midnight. This was clearly a woman who was attempting to make sense of her impending death in the best way she could. On that same morning, Anne was led to a scaffold that had been erected on the north side of the White Tower, wearing a dark grey dress of damask trimmed with fur, with a red petticoat beneath. Accompanied by two female attendants as she walked, onlookers remarked that Anne did not look upset and that she had a devilish spirit about her and seemed happy, as though she was not about to die. She climbed the scaffold and made a short speech in which she still, tellingly, did not confess to the crime she had been accused of. Good Christian people, I am come hither to die, for according to the law, and by the law I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak anything of that, whereof I am accused and condemned to die, but I pray God, save the king, and send him long to reign over you, for a gentler 
nor a more merciful prince was there never, and to me he was ever a good, a gentle and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of the world and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O Lord, have mercy on me. To God I commend my soul. At least one witness said later that the crowd were unable to hold back tears at Anne's words and were much impressed with her bravery. Her mantle was removed, her hair tucked into a coif and a blindfold put around her eyes. She bid farewell to her ladies, asked for final prayers and knelt upright in the French fashion. There is a story that the executioner had actually hidden his sword under a heap of straw, knowing how nervous Anne would be. His assistant made a sound near the scaffold steps, allowing Anne to turn her head towards the sound, still blindfolded. Having removed his shoes to make his steps soundless, the executioner took his sword and swiftly brought off the queen's head while she was still uttering her prayers. It was done as quickly and smoothly as it could be. One of the ladies present threw a white handkerchief over Anne's head. Her remains were buried without a marker in the Tower Chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula. After Anne's death, her father was turned out of his position as Lord of the Privy Seal, and Jane's brothers, Thomas and Edward, were both given lucrative positions and titles. Henry was betrothed to Jane on the 20th of May, just the day after Anne Boleyn's death. Princess Mary and her supporters didn't get what they hoped for, as Henry still remained steadfast in his reasons for abandoning Catherine of Aragon, and in June, Mary finally submitted to her father's will on the matter. Anne would remain largely unspoken of throughout Henry's reign, and all portraits of her were destroyed. This would be unchanged until Mary became queen, when she would vilify Anne once again to both honour her father's memory while still justifying a return to Catholicism. It wasn't until Elizabeth became queen that her mother's reputation would be somewhat repaired, instead repainting Anne as a Protestant martyr and a faithful wife. Anne was a complicated woman, and it's difficult to get a handle on how many of her actions were of her own volition, how many were because of the situation she found herself in, and how many were exaggerated by her enemies. It's certain that Anne knew what she wanted from life, and it's difficult to get away from the fact that she seemed at times not to care how that happened. The way in which she helped treat Catherine of Aragon was horrific, and it's something that makes it difficult to like her. But equally, how much was Anne encouraged by Henry to behave this way, and how much was actually herself, is something we will probably never really know. While it's true Anne had a temper and got into arguments, it shows she was passionate about what she believed in, and she certainly had conviction in her faith. There are even hints that Anne wanted to improve things for the ordinary people of England, through her own patronage and charity, through wanting to create work for those who needed it, and for insisting money from the monasteries should go to charity and education. In short, Anne was the other woman, but she was also human, and no one is one-sided. And regardless of how she behaved, Anne did not deserve the fate which awaited her. It's highly likely she was innocent of all charges against her, and she herself defended this until the day she died. It's clear Henry had decided to be rid of her in the only way left to him, and as with all of his subjects, Anne had to lay down her life to the tyrant Henry VIII had become. She was a complicated woman, who had shone so brightly in life, and had tried to do, really, what all women of her time did, try to get the best marriage possible and the best life possible from that. But in Anne's case, just like Icarus, she sadly flew too close to the sun.
and paid for it with her life. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.